All right, if you got your Bibles, open up with me to Psalm 126. Everybody say a divine turnaround. All right, I'm going to take a few moments and hopefully, prayerfully, by the anointing of God, stir your faith and bring great encouragement, uh, great encouragement to you. Spirit of God, we long for you. We hunger for more of you. We ask, Spirit of God, that you move in this place. We ask, God, that you touch our hearts, that you bring great strength to our, us and, and the people here. I pray that people leave this place so charged for God. If the individuals are living in sin, that they would feel the holy convicting hand of Almighty God through every word proclaimed. I pray, God, that people would come to repentance today, that people would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray that in, individuals that are bound by demonic power or de demonic theologies, uh, de demonic um, strongholds that are captive within their mind, I pray today they'd be delivered. I bind demonic power, has no right, no authority in this atmosphere. Jesus is Lord here. And Father, we give you praise today that as the word goes forth, it goes forth in fire and in power in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, I'll be preaching out at our other location, church location in Vine Grove uh, at our big spring location Tuesday, and I look forward to being out there. So if you're not, if you, if you're, if you, you're not, not going, be, be in prayer about that, that God will bless Pastor Mike and Liz and the church there that meets there. It's such a wonderful blessing. We just finished our addition, out, or didn't finish it, we got the exterior part uh, uh, done, and we're so blessed about that addition. Amen? Bought and paid for. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Psalm 126, here we go. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And then they said among the nations, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we're glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, I, 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 I got this, and I happened to look it up in the message translation. It jumped in my spirit, and so I'm gonna, I, I don't know if you have it, on, if you can do that, Emily. You can, great. Let's try the message translation. Here's what it says. It seemed like a dream, too good to be true, when God returned Zion's exiles. Now, Zion's exiles, as the children of Israel, went into, uh, into Babylonian bondage because of sin. Everybody say sin. Nations fall to the enemy when they are living in sin, and God begins to get involved. Did you hear what I just said? They perish three ways. Number one, they perish through pestilence. Secondly, they perish through war. Pestilence, war, and death, or famine. So they go into a famine, they have war, and they have pestilence. Those three areas. And the Bible tells us that the children of Israel were destroyed. Jeremiah prophesied about it, actually lived through it. And after it happened, all of Israel and Jerusalem were, were, were eradicated as Babylon came in. They lifted up individuals. They moved them out. And the Bible says that Jerusalem was destroyed. Destroyed. 586 B.C. when Babylon came in. The Bible said that they were in bondage in Babylon for over 70 years. So here, most likely, obviously, another generation rose up that this didn't happen to. So all they knew was bondage. They lived in bondage all the time. Individuals in our culture, maybe you grew up in a family where you don't know anything but alcoholism because you've grown up in a family where your dad or mom is an alcoholic or a drug addict. You don't know anything different. You've grown up in it. And now here you find yourself acting out the same exact thing. You've been in bondage all your life. It's, it's just so common nature to you. You don't know any. A normal family blows your mind. As a matter of fact, it makes you so uncomfortable when you're around. A family eats together and they actually have peace in their home and they're not yelling. It's weird to you. you almost self-destruct mode kicks in. You have to withdraw yourself and go back to the, where you're being yelled at and screamed because you feel at home. You feel comfortable. Sounds twisted, but that's what, how human nature operates. The children of Israel were in bondage. They had been in bondage for over 70 years. They didn't know anything different. And then all of a sudden, the psalmist writes this psalm, and it's depicting what happened. 
And here's what happened. They had been in bondage all their life. It seemed like a dream, too good to be true. When God returned Zion's exiles, we laughed, we sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the talk of the nations, because that's what happened when God gets involved, amen? God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us, and we are one happy people. And now, God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives, so those who planted their crops in despair will shout, yes, at the harvest. And so those who went off with the heavy hearts will come home laughing with arm loads of blessing. I want you to know today God's a good God. I don't know what you've been smoking, what you've been on. And I know there's individuals that think that God's evil and God allowed this to happen. I don't get why God, I don't understand everything, but I know this, God is good. You got to run your thoughts through two thoughts in anything you interpret out of God's word. Number one, God is always good, always There's no evil in God. There's no good in the devil. God is always good, and the devil is always bad. So every thought you get in your mind about God, if it accuses God, that's the devil operating through you, trying to get you to accuse God of evil. My friend, it is impossible for God to do evil. And the only reason you might think God is doing evil is because your warped mind is so demonically inspired in situations and believing what you've been taught or told or your experiences that it is now... It's kind of like a computer trying to operate with a virus. It doesn't function right. And so all of a sudden now your thoughts are not good thoughts. You have to function properly. And the way you do that and get the word of God properly in you is God is always good. I don't understand what's going on in my life. I don't get it. I don't have to get it. I don't have to understand everything. If God's not revealing something to me and I don't get it and I start questioning God or the enemy starts trying to get me to say, well, why is God doing this? I just say, God knows, what's he, God's, God knows what he's doing. I'm just gonna trust the Lord. Sometimes you gotta blindly trust God and sometimes it's not just for a month, it's a lifetime. You just gotta let it go. People that always gotta have answers and ask this, they're headed for trouble. God is good. Anyone that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Come on, somebody say, God is good. He's a good God. He's so good that he loved you and I so much that while we were yet in sin, he died for us. Not one person in here should go to heaven. Everyone in here belongs in hell. You violated God's moral code. You, you did it. You broke every law of the commandments of God. You say, no, I didn't. Yes, you did, because you just, you're just full of pride because you think you didn't. You are filthy, rotten to the core. There's nothing good in you that said, well, God just saw me and saw my heart, and that's why I'm going to heaven, because God knows my heart. God knows, does know your heart according to the word of the Lord. It says your heart is wicked, despicably wicked, actually. The Bible said all your good works are but filthy rags in the sight of God. If you compare yourself by a murderer, you might look pretty good, but you judge yourself by God. My friend, you are in deep, serious trouble, and you need saving. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you need to get saved. (laughs) Amen. Now, if somebody's not, they're going to feel the conviction when you said that. And if somebody's saved when you said that, they're just going, thanks be to God, I'm saved. Amen. Amen. If we will seek God and walk in his ways, you get blessed. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. It just said blessed is the man. Nor stands in the path of sinners. I don't understand apathetic, complacent Christians. I don't understand one foot in, one foot out. Why aren't you walking in the blessing? You got feet in both worlds. You can't do that. It's one world, my friend. Some jump in for a little while. Then at the first opportunity to jump out, they jump out. That's called spiritual fornication. In and out with no commitment. Nor he sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The problem with the modern-day church today is everybody thinks they're walking in the Psalm chapter 1, and they're not at all. They go to church, but they're not in the blessing. They read their Bible periodically, but they're not in the blessing. 
The blessing comes through a surrendered life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The, the blessing of the Lord comes when he's actually Lord of our lives and he's not put on the shelf along with many other idols. Look what it says when you meditate on, upon God's law day and night. It says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, we talked about rivers this past week, didn't we? What's at the bottom of that well? Well, it's an underground river that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Look at Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1 and 2. And it shall come to pass if, everybody say if, you diligently obey. That's what it is. It's not about passive. It's about diligence. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey God. I'm going to obey the Lord. Now watch this. You can't obey God unless you're born again. You got to get born again. Otherwise, you're under the sentence of death. And, not, and when you're under that sentence of death, now most people that are under a sentence of death don't realize they're under a sentence of death until they get born again. The moment you get born again, you're like, ooh, this is, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Right? But you and I as born again, you say, well, I mean, if you're born again and you're going through some seasons, you just say, okay, wait a minute. The word says that I'm to be blessed. I'm not seeing blessing over here. In my emotional life, I'm having trouble over here. I'm having major problems with anxiety over here. I'm having problems with depression over here. I'm having problems with my finances. Come on, some. See, when these things begin, you're looking at it, you got to say, wait a minute. I got to get it in line with God's word. God's word said, if I meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. So the key is, have you opened this word up? It, has it become a part of your life? Has it become your, your, your instruction manual? Well, I don't understand it when I read it. Read it anyways. God didn't say, well, you just read the word and meditate on it as long as you get it. You're not going to get it until you meditate on it. Why are we med meditating? We're meditating so we can get it. Well, how do we get it? Well, as we meditate on the Lord, the Lord enlightens it through the Spirit of God, and it comes alive. The Word of the Lord said the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating to dividing soul and spirit, joint and moral. You want to be a supernatural person? you got to learn to divide the Word of God. How do you do that? You get in God's presence and wait upon the Lord. you got to get some fire back in you. Well, Pastor, I don't have a prayer life. Why? Because you have idols in your life. No other reason. Idols. Why is this word not in, in my life? Why is it not important to me? Idols. Idol worship. What do you do? Get an axe. You cut that tree down because you don't want God to have to do it. The axe is at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruit, what? Will be thrown. I want everything that's on, the, on me that's not supposed to be on me, that's withering and drying up. I want God to come around, prune it off of me. I want him to throw that into the fire. I don't want one part of my life. I don't want one thing in my life. I don't want to be doing nothing. And some of us are doing stuff that's not wrong in and of itself. But it's idolatry. Do you know God calls you deeper to walk with him as you walk with him? So what you were able to do and walk in God for five years, and God says, yeah, I want more. I want more intimacy. I want you to spend more time with me. You don't think God will do that? God will do that. God will do that. I said, God will do that. I was listening to Pastor Benny Hinn, as I do Pastor Benny and, and, and Pastor Rod, uh, my pastor, and, and as I was listening to Pastor Benny, he was sharing uh, about a dream that Catherine Kuhlman had. I might have shared this with you. And it, 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 Catherine Kuhlman saw the dream, and the Lord went up to one. There were three individuals. The Lord went up to one and hugged the one. Went up to another and passed the, patted that one on the shoulder. And then just kind of looked at the other and walked on. And she said, Lord, what does this dream mean? And he, she said, well, the first one, he was really beat up and needed just some compassion. And so I went up and I hugged that one. That other one, I went up and patted them on the back to encourage them on. And the other one, because the first one, that one, their, their faith was very, very weak, you know. They needed that, you know. But the last one, I just kind of looked at and moved on. That one was really strong. If you always need God to bellyache you, burp you, and people that run to revival meeting after, after revival meeting, after, they, are, they are weak. Always needing to fix. You know what? In your walk with God, sometimes God's going to be hiding himself. You read, the song, you read the Song of Solomon? I love it. I love it. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. 
It's not just talking about a love affair between a man and a woman. It is the intimate relationship between a king and his creation. And my friend, there are times where God will hide himself and you and I are supposed to jump, jump up, get up. There was one time in, the, in Song of Solomon where, where he knocked on the door and she says, do I have to get dressed again? The Lord doesn't want that. When the Lord knocks, he wants you to go, my God, the Lord knocked at the door. You're like, the Lord knocks on your heart. And, Lord, I got one more episode to watch. The Lord don't want that. Because when you're done with that episode, he won't be there. You see, he's long, longing for intimacy. And you can't say it's not important. It is important. My wife shared an article not too long ago about cell phones and this and that. I found it very intriguing when people and, and this doctor was sharing that when you come to a meeting, never have your cell phone on you because when you come to a meeting and, and, and you maybe ha you just even have it on a table, it means you're distracted. It means you're, if I sit down at, at dinner and I'm going to sit down with my wife and we're going to have dinner and she's on her cell phone, it's telling her that she, I'm not important enough to her to put that down. I want to be her knight in shining armor. I want to be her everything. I want her when she looks at me to go, oh. <laughs> Amen. Y'all look at She's back in the soundboard. Amen. <laughs> she's got that camera on me right now. She's going, oh. <laughs> Amen. That other individual didn't need much encouragement. Or didn't need, why? Because he was strong. Because he was strong. So sometimes you go through things. It doesn't mean that God's mad at you. It just means God's... See, you don't grow on the mountain peak. You grow in the valley. You don't got, grow when God's hugging you and this and that. Love. You grow when you don't feel God at all. Why? What happens? That's when you got to trust God on raw word. What he said out of his mouth. What he said out of his mouth. God said that I'm saved, that he's given me eternal life. Some of you that struggle consistently with the, oh, am I saved? Just, and it, God bless you. But you got to get to a point where that you, you're not always, you got to trust God for his word. He said it. Believe on the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. Amen. Call on the name of the Lord and he will answer thee. Amen. You just got to believe. There's times you don't feel nothing. You know, there's times I come out here and, and I'll just feel led that we got to pray for people and I don't feel nothing and I've gotta, I'm got I'm going to begin praying for people to be healed because well, he said it in his word. Some of you got to do the same thing. Well, I don't know if I, I, I'm not really feeling it right now, but I've had this financial, you know, sometimes things hit you in your life that you just got to believe God because God wants to give you a divine turnaround, but you just got to believe the word of the Lord. With the children of Israel, when they wrote this Psalm in 126, they had been in bondage for years, but just like that, everything turned around. God is in that kind of a turnaround. God wants to do that in our life. You just look, we mentioned it earlier about the woman with the issue of blood. That was a divine turnaround. What about Jairus' daughter? Divine turnaround. The woman with the, uh, who's bent over for 18 years? Divine turnaround. Lazarus, divine turnaround. Dead for four days. Divine turnaround. Supernatural manifestation with God. But see, these individuals had faith. Jesus told Jairus, uh, uh, Jairus uh, just believe. I know you got, just got a report that your daughter's dead, but only believe. So what's your, what, what am I supposed to do? Only believe. Why, that's too weak. No, 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 I got to do something. No, God said, only believe. Well, no, I got to go do No, only believe. Do you know that's the hardest thing for a lot of people? Because sometimes it's so embedded, especially in men, it's so embedded in us to do something to get something moving. And God's saying, when you do that, you're telling me you don't believe. And yet, at the summit, you got to find out what the balance is because sometimes you're supposed to move. Because God says, if you believe, you'll move. Now I'm confused. My friend, that's why you're in that secret place dwelling with God, so at one with the Spirit. Come on, like a wheel within a wheel. In Ezekiel's dream, come on somebody, everything moved in unison. Do you know that when you're moving in God, you're so connected to the Lord, and the Lord said, I pray that they'd be one even as we are one. You're moving so with the Holy Ghost of God who's in you and on you and all over you that you, decisions, how do you think we're going to reign and rule with Christ in the thousand-year millennial? How are we going to make decisions governmentally? You think he, we're going to have a, a direct line to the, to the, hot, to the hot seat there in Jerusalem? Hey, Lord, I got this situation. What do I do? No, the oil of God is going to be so on you to direct the affairs of the Lord. Well, how do you think it's going to happen right now in your life? It doesn't, it doesn't change later. You learn how to operate in the supernatural now. 
You learn how to govern, govern your affairs now. Husbands and wives are governing their children now based on the fear of the Lord and, and the scriptures. Governing your finances now. Learning how to uh, a budget. If you're always behind on your finances, God cannot bless your finances until you learn how to budget what you have now. And if you're always whining that you don't have enough, how many hours did you pray this week about a divine turnaround? See, when you haven't, you're guilty. God has given you this assignment. Do you know that according to Scripture, every person in here will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged? You'll stand before a holy God. Now, that judgment is for believers. Now, we're not talking about the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20. And then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it and the earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for him. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And each person was judged according to what was written in the book. See, he gave up the dead that were in it and death and hate, he gave up the dead that were in them. Every individual is going to be judged. Every heathen is going to be judged. The view is going to be judged. Every person, Christians at the judgment seat of Christ with what they did. Do you know some people will, will bear just, just it, it, we say it's not, and it's not by works, you're saved by grace, but did you do what he said? There's a judgment coming. The Bible says some just get in, just whoo, they just, could you imagine being that one? You just, you're the last one to make it. I need a divine turnaround. These people experience such a divine turnaround. I wrote this down as a thought. Calling for the destruction of God's people is nothing new. We saw this here and the people got delivered and they sang, sang supernatural hymns unto God. But calling for the destruction of God's people is nothing good, new. God's enemies have been crying out for God's people to be, to be destroyed from the Pharaoh ordering the murder of all children two years old and younger. We see in the modern day many radicals in eastern countries crying out for the destruction and the annihilation of the Jewish state. I don't know if you realize this, but most individuals that are born into Islam will say they want the destruction of the Jewish state. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that on October 7th, there was a, there was a mandate of individuals that went in and destroyed, how many, was it 1,200 People, many children burned alive. Parents burned. Children, children decapitated. And yet most of the stuff you'll see on the mainstream news is free Palestine. Well, I don't have a problem with free. There's a lot of innocent and wonderful church people in Palestine, but they put people in authority over their government that were Hamas, which are demonic, and they slaughtered 1,200 people. The Jewish state has a right to defend themselves and obliviate, annihilate. Why is it that Hamas is hiding in hospitals where innocent people are? Because they're cowards. I'm sorry if an enemy is behind lines. You got to do what you got to do. And unfortunately, casualties are there. I don't understand the mindset of the culture. I, I believe many of them are demonized. When people start hating Israel, you be careful. Genesis chapter 12, the blessing of Abraham. Those who bless you, I'll bless. And those that curse you, I'll curse. They've been cursing Israel since the beginning. And they're going to be cursing Israel all the way to the end. The final war that's going to be taking place is all nations will gather around Israel again. Happened in happened 1948. They became a nation again right after the, a little bit after the Holocaust. Six million Jews were executed. Hitler had a big, big fetish against the Jewish people. Killed them because they're God's people and Christians. 1967, we had the Six-Day War where all the nations gathered around Israel. On six, day, six days, Israel obliviated the adversary. Thousands, they, were, they multiplied thousands compared to, their, to every one that they had in their army, multiplied thousands surrounding them. Supernaturally, God intervened. Divine turnaround. At the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles last year in 2023, that very night, radicals stormed Israel on October 6th and killed 1,200 individuals. Isn't that crazy? The evening of Feast of Tabernacles, a Feast of Israel. It's celebrated 
50, well, celebrated. It was an anniversary 50 years earlier. There was the Yom Kippur War of 1973. On that very night, they did it again. And that war was with the Arabs as well, Egypt and Syria. God's people have always been under attack. Why do you think you're going to be any different? Are you God's people? You might not be a Jew by, boor, by birth, but the moment you get born again, you, you became a, a, a child of the living God, grafted in as one of the same house. So you're a child of God. So you don't think that, you don't think that when you get delivered of drugs, you don't think the devil wants to come back and put you back on drugs so your kids can grow up without a daddy? You don't think the devil wants to do that? Maybe you should think about that the next time you want to toke on a, uh, on a, on a, on a, on a marijuana cigarette. And justify it by saying you need it for medicinal purposes. No, you do, do it because you want to get high. That's exactly why you do it. And that's exactly why you don't have a, a deep relationship with God. Unless you're like Prince, then you write songs about God, but you've been stoned while you're writing it. And it's not really God at all. It's a demonic principality who calls himself God. And so you bow to another demon, and so you find out 10, 20 years in life that you get darker and darker and darker rather than more on fire for Jesus. I need a divine turnaround. The Jewish people needed a divine turnaround. Today is a feast of, in Israel called Purim. We mentioned that. The Jews were under the, the occupation at that time of the Persian Empire. And the king's right-hand man, Haman, hated the Jews, so he ordered their destruction. Same spirit. We want the destruction of the Jewish people. The king's wife was a Jew, but unknown to the king. Esther, it was her name, stands for righteousness and exposes Haman's plot. And in a moment, what looked impossible turned around and Haman was destroyed. Haman said, on this specific day, every Jew is going to be executed. At the king's command, it couldn't be reversed. Esther then revealed the plan to the king. And then the king had Haman hung on Esther's uncle, who was a Jew at the front gate, who would not bow to Haman when Haman would walk in, who the king commanded him to bow to. His name was Haman COVID. No, I ain't bowing. Bow! He wouldn't bow. We didn't bow. You think, it's, you, you think I'm joking? I ain't joking. He wouldn't do this. He said, I bow, no, no one but, I, I bow to no one but God. Haman hated the fact that that's why he wanted to have him killed. And so so the, the word of the Lord said he built a gallows for him that's so he could be hung on it. And when the queen exposed him, she, the very thing he had set up for, for, um, for Mordecai, he got hung on it. But now the situation arises on that specific day, the Jewish people, because it, it already had gone through 120 provinces, 127 provinces, that the, the, the people could annihilate the Jews. So they got a problem. And so she goes to the king and says, please, he says, whatever you want, I'll do it. He says, Give us the right to defend ourselves. Isn't that crazy? It sounds like what's going on today, doesn't it? And what did they do? They obliviated the adversary. Everyone that hated the Jews was executed. Everyone. So that they could not rise up and hurt them again. They rejoiced over it so much. They were so thankful that God had provided such a thing that they formulated this festival called Purim or Purim. The Jews then went and killed all the enemies of God that you see today the enemies of God that you see today tomorrow will be gone. Moses spoke that, and we see that in the word of the Lord says, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, Exodus 14, 13, thank you for that, and Moses said to the people, this is right after, now watch this, do not be afraid, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, 
which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you'll not see again forever. Now, we know the story. They were in bondage. The children of Israel were in bondage for over 400 years to the Egyptians. Now, some people in here, you say, well, what's this have to do with me? It has everything to do with you, especially if you've been under the thumb, maybe of addiction, of twisted perversion, a spirit of homosexuality. You don't know your identity. That's a spirit. It has nothing to do with you. It's a demonic spirit. And God is merciful. But you got to repent. Just like an individual is bound in compulsive lying. So individuals that need Jesus represent the people in bondage in Egypt. They came out of bondage. Moses is leading them, a representative of our Lord and Savior Jesus. He's leading them. And they come up to the Red Sea. So he got, watch, an impossible situation. The Red Sea before them, and what happens? Pharaoh changes his mind after he let him go. Ten plagues, the last one, the, the oldest, uh, uh, or the, young, uh, the firstborn, will be executed by God. So the death angel would come. But anyone who put up blood of a lamb upon the doorpost and lintel of their home, the death angel would pass over. That's why they call it Passover, which, by the way, Passover usually is during resurrection season uh, around this time. But they're messing with the calendars. The Hebrew calendar is actually the 22nd of April. So technically, really, Easter is a pagan name, but should be in um, April. But I don't have a problem with that. I'm not going to sit there and go, we're not going to celebrate. The world is celebrating our Lord and Savior, so let's just join with them. Amen. I, I, I don't believe it. Ma- I think it matters what specific day, but just FYI. And you say, why is that? Well, I think Feasts of Israel are very important to you and I because we're paying attention to the stars in the sky. These lunar, this lunar uh, um, uh, cycle, as well as the solar eclipse, very important on biblical things. As we know, we heard about it. They're going through what? Starting in Jonah, Texas, which Jonah, we know the story of Jonah. And then it goes through seven cities, and one of those cities, all seven of them are called Nineveh. Jonah prophesied to Nineveh what? Forty days, judgment's coming. Now, why is that passing through that way? It passed, 2017, we had a solar eclipse as well. went this way across the United States. This one's going this way. Right at the X, if, you, if, if they follow, that X, X marks the spot. The road that it goes over is Salem. The word Salem means Jerusalem. This one that's going, in, it's going to go through 27 cities called Salem. Seven years ago, it went through six cities that are Salem. That makes 33. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Our Lord and Savior, 33. I, I, it's just coincidence, okay. God's, t- God's talking to us. I believe we're on the precipice of a turnaround. I believe God's about ready to hang Haman on the gallows. You, what does that mean? The, for you, it could mean this. It could mean whatever's been nagging you. What, whatever's been trying to destroy you. You see what I'm saying? Whatever's been trying to come against you. But you can't do what, People that are unbelievers just blow this stuff off. Believers, and I don't mean unbelievers that like you're saved or not saved, because you can have believers that don't, just don't want to believe in the supernatural power of God. There's a lot of good people that are Baptists, but they don't believe in the power of healing. So guess what? They won't enjoy the benefits of healing. But they'll go to heaven because they believe in salvation. There's a lot of great Baptist people. As a matter of fact, some Baptists are better than Pentecostals in regards to being very nice people. Some Pentecostals are nasty. I mean, they are sorry. They tongue talk and everything, but I, I don't know what spirit they got. They don't have the, I don't know if they got the Holy Ghost or not because there's no fruit there, which is scary, don't you think? Amen. I want the band to come on up, please. I want you to keep that scripture up. I want to read it again, and I want you guys to see it. Watch this. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. That's it right there. Stand still. Somebody say, stand still. still. See, it's not what you can do. It's what God does. Sometimes we get in a situation where you don't know what to do. That's exactly what, what you, you say, what, 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 what's that? I was just talking to, I, I think I was talking to Neil before the service, and I said three things. When bad things happen to you, maybe it's because of sin. When evil things happen to you, it's probably the devil. When you don't understand what's going on, it's probably God. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, this had nothing to do with them being saved spiritually. It had to do with them being saved from, the, the, from these, this situation where they've, they've got a sea in front of them, impossible sea they couldn't cross, They were cornered with Pharaoh's army behind them. God brought a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to be behind them to hold off Pharaoh. And Moses gets a clue. God says, what are you crying about? 
get up, stretch out your rod. He stretched it out, and the, and the, the Bible tells us the, the Red Sea parted. I heard a heathen say um, that, that during that time, it wasn't really that big of a deal, you know, that it was the water was only like, you know, eight inches tall or something like that, you know. And then I heard somebody respond in there and said, yeah, well, that's, that's even more of a miracle because God drowned all of Pharaoh's army in eight inches of water. Amen? And there are documented, you, you watch History Channel stuff, there's documented accounts where they have found wheels and stuff on the bottom of the Red Sea. Isn't that crazy? To declaring that this stuff really happened. Look at this. So Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Say, somebody say, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Why, why don't you have to be afraid? Because I'm going to stand still and I'm going to see the salvation of the Lord. Not my arm. There's things in your walk with God, sometimes you... Oh, I don't worry means you're not trusting. What do you do when you start worrying? Because we all go in those moments where we worry. When you start worrying, you run into the presence of God. You just, you know, pump up your prayer time some more. Get along with God more. It's of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. So there was a divine turnaround in a day. He said today. for the Watch, this is powerful. For the Egyptians whom you see today... You shall see again no more forever. You know what? There's been times even in my own walk where I'm going to say that it seemed like the, the, the battle went on forever, but then I can say it happened in a day. So every victory happened like boom, but, it, but the victory, it seemed like I fought that battle forever. I mean, there's things I've gone through. It seemed like it was five years, six years. One situation I've told you all about, a year and a half of dealing with this oppressive spirit as a pastor. I had this thing hanging around my life for a year and a half. What did I do? I pressed in and pressed in. I pressed in, cried, 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 pressed in, pressed in, cried, cried, cried. And then all of a sudden, I'm driving down here. And boom, it's, it's just gone. It's gone. What was it? Well, the devil doesn't want me to finish my, my race. The devil don't want you to finish your race. Sometimes it's going to get tough. But God made you a promise. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But you say, well, knowing that is what brings peace. See, you, I know it more now today because he's proven himself faithful. I was talking to the Lord again yesterday, and there's three things I've shared this with you so many times. But again, the Lord asked me, what do you, he asked me this probably in my 36 years, maybe five or six times, and I've answered him. And when I say he asked me, it's in my spirit. I don't, I've never heard God audibly. And so I just felt, what do you love about me? I said, I love your... I, and I thought for a minute, as I always do, because I didn't know if it's changed. And it's always the same thing. You're faithful. Well, actually, that's the second thing. The first thing is your mercy. Because then I said you're faithful. Your mercy. Because I can't know he's faithful unless I first know his mercy. I can't even get into his presence unless I first recognize the fact that I'm a sinner. Your mercy. My God, I don't deserve God. Number two, you've been faithful. 36 years for my life. He's never let me down. I've gone through some hell. Maybe not as much as some of you, but I've gone through some hell, and he's always been there. And then because of those two things, mercy, faithfulness, I can't even know the third one unless I know these two. He loves me. My God. I, I really, he loves me. I think he loves me more than he loves you. Come on, you, you ought to feel that way sometimes. You ought to look to somebody and say, I think he loves me more than he does you. I think I'm his favorite. Come on, just say God loves me. See, but you can't really know that until you first understand he's been merciful to you. And when he's been merciful to you, he's going to prove himself faithful to you. And then when he proves himself faithful, you, you can't go back. Jesus said this, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. You, why are you struggling with those things still? Because, see, they're not... He, once, once he reveals himself to you that he's merciful and he's faithful, it's going to be as easy as pie to flow and walk in obedience to him because everything flows out of that love intimacy. Obedience flows out of love. I don't obey God because I have to. I obey God because I love him. I just love him. And why do I love him so much? Because he's been so merciful. I mean, he forgave me, and then I said, I'm sorry, and then I, I said, forgive me, and then I knew I was going to do it again, and I did it again, he still forgave me, and then I'd be crying out to God, don't forgive me, because I'm a worm. I know I'm going to do it again. I know I'm going to live like the devil. 
And I've been on fire for 36 years. I didn't all like I went back into the world. I just struggled with the flesh like everybody else. But guess what? You're not sinless, but you'll sin less. The more you live for God, you'll walk so tight with God. You don't want to violate that intimacy at all. I just want that relationship with him. Everybody stand up on your feet, please. No one moving around, please. I'm going to ask everyone to just close your eyes for a moment. I want your faith to erupt today for a divine turnaround. Maybe you're, you're up between that Red Sea and Pharaoh's armies barking down your backside. You need God to show up. You say, what do I do? I'm afraid. You just wait on God and say, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. The Egyptians I see today, I'll not see. Egypt started, or I'm sorry, the children of Israel started walking through that Red Sea. They got to the other side, they start fretting. Because Pharaoh's army on the other side start running in. Hilarious. God's got a sense of humor. I believe they're like little tonky, little to what do they call them, tonky toys or something? Tonka toys? Yeah. I think God's little, little fair, these little Pharisees with their wheels and just, ping, God just kind of takes his finger and just knocks a wheel off. And he starts start rolling. Watch the, I, Hey, Michael, check this out. Gabriel, check this out. Pink. God's just having a heyday. The children of Israel are freaking out. You know God didn't want them to freak out? God don't want you to freak out either. God don't want you to have it hard, but God wants you to learn to trust Him. And so He brings situations in because when you start trusting God like that, then the next time you go through it, it's not going to be nothing to you because you're going to know God did that before. God knocked those wheels off. So I'm, I'm, And guess what? Then it's a witness because people are going to be looking at you going, you're supposed to be losing your mind. And you're sitting there going, uh, Jesus is in the boat. He's sleeping. He wants us to be sleeping, resting, not staying up late night worrying. People, you, for some of us tonight, this message may not mean a lot, but in a week, a month, two months, you may have to pull on this message more than you realize. Trust God. God will sustain you through until a turnaround. Amen. He's got us. I want every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're in this place, and the reason for that is because I want you alone with God, not because I'm, I'm ashamed or I think you should be ashamed of the gospel. But there are some people that aren't ready to meet God. And today, the, the greatest turnaround that you could have would be to surrender your life to Jesus. And some people need to get right with God. And the Lord brought you here today to invite you to be a part of His kingdom. But you got to turn to the Lord. You got to turn to the Lord. You got to say, God, I need you in my life. If you stand before God and God says to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? If you said, well, I'm a good person or I'd give the shirt off my back, you're not ready for heaven. Because my friend, that's all based in your work. The only way heaven is available is when a person admits they're sinners needing a savior that Jesus died for them and they're trusting in Him for salvation. That's the only way into heaven. There's no other way. And I'm going to count to three. And you say, Pastor, I need to get right with God. And when I do, if you say, Pastor, that's me. I want to give my life to the Lord. I want you to shoot your hand up high. I want to give my hand to Jesus. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to, I want to come to God. I'm not, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. I want, to know, I want to leave this place knowing I'm right with God. When I count to three, if that's you, lift your hand up high. For some of you, this may be the very first time. Maybe this is something you say, I need a divine turnaround. And my life is not headed in the right direction. I'm believing God for that turnaround today. When I count to three, if that's you, raise your hand up high. Get ready. One, get ready. Two, three. Lift your hand up high. Lift your hand up high. I see your hand. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hand. I'm in, I'm in, can I get some deacons up here, please? Some of my deacons, please. Come on in tight, please. Miss Nettie, come on in tight. Thank you. Those of you who raised your hand, I'm going to count to three one more time. I want you to get out of your seat. If you didn't raise your hand but you knew you're not right with God, listen. I don't believe we got as much time as people think and whether or not Jesus comes now or not here's the truth anyone can meet God tonight you can leave this place and be in eternity tomorrow 
When I count to three, you raise your hand, but maybe you didn't, but you wish you would have. I'm going to count to three one more time. And if you want to get right with God, you come. And one of these individuals right here is going to pray with you, and you can give your heart to the Lord right here at this altar. So if you raise your hand, you come on up, and you pray with one. Well, get ready. One, two, three. Do it right now. Do it right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come. God bless you. I see you. Come on. If you mean business with God, you come. You come. You come. You come. Jesus said, if you're ashamed to confess me before men, I'll be ashamed to confess you before my Father in heaven. You come. You come. God bless you, brother. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. You come. Amen. You come. I'm giving my heart to God. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I need to be born again. I'm not right with the Lord. Somebody be praying in here. Come on. My God, the power, the power of God is on. Come on, keep praying. God bless you. God bless you. Miss Nettie, let this young man pray with this man right here. Make sure you lead them in the sinner's prayer. Those of you here, lead them in the sinner's prayer. Come on, somebody say praise the Lord. Now listen, if God, you needed God to give you a turnaround, everyone in here, lift your hands to heaven and expect God for it right now. Lord, I'm expecting a divine turnaround. I'm leaving this place in faith, believing God in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Amen. We're going to continue to worship for a few moments, but you all are dismissed. God bless you. We'll be back for the drama tonight. Don't miss it. It's going to be awesome. Come on, let's sing.